This last one, I wish, was a work of irony. Uh, but is in fact someone's earnest opinion. Someone wrote this and thought to themselves, this is what I should I should be writing right now. This is the, the important story that I need to tell. And it has made the rounds, and if you're into dramatic readings, you've probably read this one before, or heard it read by somebody else, but it's, it's too important to pass up. Without further ado, I present to you How Millennials Killed Mayonnaise. How Millennials Killed Mayonnaise. The inexorable rise of identity condiments has led to hard times for the most American of foodstuffs. And that's a shame. I write this in the dead of summer. Always a bittersweet season. Why is it we get summers off from school for all those years, but don't get summers off from work? But doubly depressing these days, when I find myself suffering from picnic panic. The hot, languid weather brings with it a series of outdoor family events for which, as a tribal elder, I am charged with providing provisions. Lately, though, I've had my feet cut out from under me. For years, nay, decades... My contributions to the Hingston clan's Memorial Day and Fourth of July and Labor Day gatherings were no-brainers. I made what my mother once made. She was such a good cook that when she died prematurely, my husband and I typed up and photocopied, quaint, I know, a booklet of her recipes, tried and true favorites on which she built her formidable culinary reputation. When the holidays rolled around, I simply recreated one of her delicious dishes and toted it along. Along about a decade though, ago, though, I began to notice I was toting home as much of my authorings as I'd concocted. My contributions were being overlooked or shunned. Why should this be? Mom's extraordinary potato salad, fragrant with dill, spiced by celery seed, went untouched on the picnic table. So did her macaroni salad and her chicken salad and her deviled eggs. When I carted home a good three pounds of painstakingly prepared Waldorf salad, all that peeling and coring and slicing, I was forced to face facts. The family's tastes had changed. Or rather, our family had changed. Oldsters were dying off, and the youngsters taking our places in the paper plate line were different somehow. I racked my brain for the source of this generational disconnect. And then... One holiday weekend, while surveying the condiments set aside at a burger fam family burger bash, I found it. On offer were four different kinds of mustard, three ketchups, one made from, I kid you not, bananas, seven sorts of salsa, kimchi, wasabi, relishes of every ilk and hue. What was missing, though, was the common foundation of all mom's picnic foods, mayonnaise. While I wasn't watching, mayo's day had come and gone. It's too basic for contemporary tastes, pale and insipid and not nearly exotic enough for our era of globalization. Good old mayo has become the Taylor Swift of condiments. My mom was the daughter of Lithuanian immigrants, Born in the era in which huddled masses clambered ashore at Ellis Island, their pockets stuffed with kielbasa and chorizo and bronchwinger and makanek and lopchong, and were processed in the great American assimilation grinder, emerging to dine happily ever after on Hatfield hot dogs and potato salad. Her entire life she worried about sticking out, about not fitting in. She was self-conscious that her parents spoke with accents. She worked like a tiger to haul herself out of South Philly via Girls High and Temple, where she met my dad, whose American heritage stretched a few decades further back, and whose people came from the British Isles, the omphalos of bland food. 
America in the 1950s was full of strivers like Mom, desperate to forget family legacies of latkes and box ties and bromboraki pouring through the pages of Family Circle and Good Housekeeping and Woman's Day for stars and stripes recipes that repped their newfound land. They wanted all their strangeness to dissolve into the sizzling pot of Crisco that crisped their French, not French, fries. Granted, it's profoundly unfortunate, in esculent terms, that the nation's newcomers fixated on foods from England and Ireland and Scotland. But women's magazines back then were almost in exclusively edited by wasps. Besides, the impetus seemed righteous. In a world torn asunder by the Great Depression, the Holocaust, and two world wars, our citizenry needed to come together, be united, rally behind a collective vision of what it meant to be American. You lived in a single-family house, you drove a station wagon, you wore bowling shirts and blue jeans, and you slathered mayonnaise on everything from BLTs to burgers to pastrami on rye. How do you think hold the mayo became a saying? There was always mayo, and if you were some kind of deviant who didn't want it, you had to say it out loud. My son, Jake, who's 25, eats mayo. He's a practical young man who works in computers and adores macaroni salad. He's a good son. I also have a daughter. She's a woman's and gender studies major in college. Naturally, she loathes mayonnaise. Something about gender studies majors that, that makes you detest mayonnaise? And she's not alone. Oh God. Ask the young people you know their opinion of mayo and you'll be shocked by the depths of their emotion. Oh, there's the occasional outlier, like Jake. But for the most part, today's youth would sooner get their news from an actual paper newspaper than ingest mayonnaise. The origins of this contentious condiment are hotly debated. Its name derived from the city of Mayan on the Balearic island of Menorca, where the Duke de Richelieu's chief, unable to find cream for a sauce to celebrate his lordship's successful siege during the Seven Years' War, substituted an, em an emulsion of eggs and oil? Or is it a bastardization of bayonets from the garlic town renowned for its tasty hams? Whatever. Either way, the dressing had crossed the Atlantic by 1838 when Chichi Manhattan restaurant Delmonico's offered both lobster and chicken mayonnaise on its menu. Mayo spread ha, to the more common man after the invention of the mechanical bread slicer just in time for sandwiches to be tucked inside brown bags and unwrapped in the lunchrooms of the nation's factories. Mayonnaise at this point was still mostly handmade, whisked up by wives as needed, but the culinary horizon was shifting. In 1912, the German immigrant owner of an Upper West Side deli, Richard Hellman, began to sell mayonnaise packed in jars decorated with three blue ribbons, according to culinary historian Andrew Smith. <clears throat> These jars differed from those of Hellman's condiment competitors in one vital way. They had wide mouths, enabling customers to get big-ass spoons inside. Sales were so successful that two years later, Hellman sold his deli to open the first in an ever-growing series of manufacturing facilities devoted to Hellman's blue ribbon mayonnaise. At one point, when Hellman and his wife were in Europe to research product distribution, travel agents urged them to sail back to the U.S. on a shiny new ship, the Titanic, that was making its maiden voyage. They took a smaller ship instead. And thank God, because Hellman's was the only mayonnaise my mayo-doting dad ever ate. Yes, thank God for the disaster, the Titanic, the disaster which Hellman averted so that he could prevent the collapse of mayonnaise for a whole century. <clears throat> more than a hundred years after its creation, Hellman still sells more than half the mayonnaise in the nation. It is, Ari Laveau wrote in Slate a few years back, the standard by which all others are judged. Laveau interviewed a professional taster who, he says, considers Hellman's 
a member of an exclusive group of products that are so refined and sophisticated that it's hard for the average palate to break them down into their component flavors. You don't taste egg in Hellman's, the taster explained. You don't taste oil or vinegar. All the flavors blend together. They're balanced. Nothing sticks out. Everything is appropriate. Nothing sticks out. Mayonnaise isn't bland. It's artfully blended. It's an evocation of the era I grew up in, of the homogeneity of that old, dead American dream. One of the reasons for mayonnaise's early popularity, according to public health historian David Merritt Johns, was that it served to disguise flaws in the ingredients it coated. Potatoes passed their due date. Flabby cabbage, tuna that was less than pristine. Young people like my daughter somehow seem to have extrapolated this masking function from condiment to culture. For them, mayo quite literally whitewashed America's immigrants eat into eating dull food. And newer generations are refusing to meekly fall in line with a culinary heritage that never was theirs. Instead, they're gobbling up kefir and ashvar and chimtree and gochujang goch again. They're also shunning their parents' preferred restaurants, Applebee's, Ruby Tuesday, TGI Fridays, to seek out more authentic fare. Old school eateries, in turn, are diversifying in their search for new customers. Just this year, Red Lobster rolled out a waffles and lobster option, and Red Robin launched a vegan burger. You don't put mayo on a vegan burger. McDonald's has debuted a signature sriracha burger, joining KFC, Wendy's, and Subway in signing on to the sizzling Thai sauces moment in the sun. You didn't see Hoi Fong Food start a schmear campaign against the cultural appropriation of that. But what young people really, really love to hate on is mayonnaise. Back in 2013, BuzzFeed ran an article, ran an article titled 24 Reasons Mayonnaise is the Devil's Condiment. The author called it Slime of Satan. Just three years later, BuzzFeed ran another piece, 23 Things You'll Only Understand If You Fucking Hate Mayo. By a different author, there was no overlap. Drew Maggery penned a piece for Bon Appetit with the headline, Big Mayo Will Destroy Us All. A movie called The Mayo Conspiracy won the Best Comedy Feature at the 2015 World's Independent Film Festival. It concerns the gradual uncovering by a journalist of a mayonnaise cartel that plans to take over the world. Clearly, there's something more to this river of resentment than a miscable mixture of eggs and oil. And it's obvious to me that this condimental divide can be traced to young folks' rejection of what they sneeringly consider a boring white food. Do you think 23andMe and MyHeritage and all those other DNA testing companies are flourishing because people want to find out their ancestors came from Aberdeen? Hells no. They want to be from Marrakesh or Manchuria or Malawi. It's the same with condiments. I'm not part of the elderly mayo masses. I'm turkey and Swiss with ciabatta and tzatziki, tzatziki, chipotle spread, and a little basil pesto. That's who I am, damn it. My sandwich, myself. <sighs> Granted, there are other theories regarding mass generational mayonnaise rejection. Some experts say the dislike springs from the fact that mayo jiggles. You may have noticed youth's similar circumvention of gelled salads. My mom made a dynamite one with black cherry jello, walnuts, olives, canned cherries, and small balls of cream cheese. Others posit that mayonnaise is reminiscent of body, bodily fluids and therefore, as Penn psychology professor Paul Rosen has suggested, too disgusting to ingest. Kendra Pierre-Louis got right down to it re-mayo in popular science. Its viscous quality is the sort of thickness that you'd get from a fluid oozing out of a rotted carcass, as someone who has ever poked a rotted squirrel with a stick can attest. And the creamy appearance of mayonnaise isn't dissimilar from what would emerge from, say, a popped zit. This is bullshit. 
This attitude comes to you from young people who willfully, willingly slurp down eight gazillion kinds of yogurt, not to mention raw fish and pork belly and, yo, detergent pods. So don't talk to me about mayonnaise. The only reason for this raging mayophobia is a generation's gut-level renouncement of the greatest generation's condiment of choice. But here's the thing. The all-American condiment didn't have to be mayonnaise. It could have been ketchup or mustard. Hell, it could have been horseradish, but it wasn't. It's not Mayo's fault that it's been so successful, that it glimpsed a condiment breach and jiggled right on through. As Boston chef Scott Jones told Ari Laveau, the magic that sets mayonnaise above Coke and Heinz is that mayo is a perfect flavor carrier. It just makes everything better. Need proof? Do other condiments have pale imitators like Miracle Whip and Just Mayo and Veganaise? I don't think so! Hey, we're all capable of growth, you know. I added a little fish sauce to my stir-fry these, these days. I also have a bottle of salsa lasado on my refrigerator door. I thought young people today were supposed to be all about inclusion, about kindness and compassion and making other people feel welcome. So how about you include a little mayo in your picnic fare? Mayonnaise has been the building block for a thousand different tweaks in a rainbow of cultures. Russian dressing, Russian dressing, remoulade, comeback sauce, fry sauce, sauce, cupy, salsa risotto, mayo chup. Just because something is old and white doesn't mean it's obsolete. Oh, projection much. Look at Shakespeare. Look at me. Oh, not projection. Just regular. Oh, uh, wow. Um, yeah, what the fuck is mayo chup? Uh, anyway. Then again, it may be too late to staunch the mayo hate. America may already be too far gone. While I was researching this article... What? You think I just pulled this stuff out of thin air? I came across some news that for one brief shining moment filled me with hope. An organization known as the Association for Dressings and Sauces, or ADS, took a poll that revealed something amaz amazing. Millennials love mayo, the headline screamed. According to ADS, older millennials, those aged 25 to 34, are the most frequent purchasers of my mom's favored condiment, ahead of the next most frequent, which would happen to be my demographic, boomers aged 55 to 65. Granted, we boomers are all anxious to avoid the Mayo Clinic. But could a new generation really be primed and ready to take up Richard Hellman's torch? Uh, no. Tucked well down in the report in the survey was this nugget, courtesy of ADS Executive Director Jean Maluski. Jeannie Maluski. We were founded as the Mayonnaise Products Manufacturers Association and had to change your name to stay relevant. Okay, Association for Dressings and Sauces. I see how it is. The saddest part is, my mom's macaroni salad is banging. You kids are only cheating yourselves by rejecting it. Besides, I've got news. That aioli you're all so fond of? I hate to break it to you, but that's just mayonnaise. Banging. <laughs> All right. <laughs>